and welcome to The Rob Burgess Show. I am, of course, your host, Rob Burgess. On this, our 113th episode, our guest is Amy Siskind. Amy Siskind is a national spokesperson, writer, and expert on helping women and girls advance and succeed. A former Wall Street executive, she's president and co-founder of The New Agenda, a national organization working on issues including economic independence and advancement, gender representation and bias, and campus sexual assault. Amy's advocacy for equality now occurs alongside her mission as one of the most thorough and vocal observers of our failing but not yet failed democracy. In the immediate aftermath of Donald Trump's election as president, Amy began compiling a list of actions taken by the Trump regime that pose a threat to our democratic norms. Under the headline, Experts in Authoritarianism Advise to Keep a List of Things Subtly Changing Around You So You'll Remember, Siskin's weekly list began as a project she shared with friends, containing less than 10 items, but soon it went viral, and now has more than half a million viewers and upwards of 100 entries per week. Even as the weekly list grew in size, the themes remained consistent. Trump fanned the flames of hate, worked to silence dissent and intimidate the opposition, and alienated our world allies and cozied up to authoritarians. The weekly list is now being archived by the Library of Congress. Compiled in one volume for the first time, the list, a week-by-week reckoning of Trump's first year, is a first draft history and a comprehensive accounting of Donald Trump's first year. Beginning with Trump's acceptance of white supremacists the week after the election and concluding a year to the day later, we watch as Trump and his regime chips away at rights and protections of marginalized communities of women, of us all, via Twitter storms, unchecked executive action, and shifting rules and standards. The list chronicles not only the scandals that made headlines, but just as important, the myriad smaller but still consequential unprecedented acts that otherwise fall through the cracks. When she's not working on the lists, Amy spearheads the new agenda's annual events and speaks on college campuses and to young professional women about economic empowerment and strategies for success. She serves on Cornell University's highly prestigious President's Council of Cornell Women and Cornell University Council and was recently honored by the Westchester County legislators for her LGBTQ advocacy. On Wall Street, Amy was a pioneer in the distressed debt trading market. She became the first female managing director at Wasserstein Perella at the age of 31 and later ran trading departments at Morgan Stanley and Imperial Capital, where she was also a partner. She received a BA in economics from Cornell University and an MBA in finance and international business from the NYU Stern School of Business. Amy lives outside New York City with her children and famous dogs, Arlene and Shep, both named after her former Wall Street colleagues. And now on to the show. Hi, I'm, I'm Amy Siskin. I'm author of the book, The List, and I also keep a weekly list of things that Trump does that are not normal at the website, theweeklylist.org, and also started recently a podcast that accompanies the weekly list that summarizes what happens and gives some context. Hmm. Yeah, and uh, I was interested to read in your bio that you sent me that you're a former Wall Street executive. Um, what Can you tell us about your time there, and how did you make the switch away from that? Sure. I started out after college. I worked on Wall Street for 20 years, which I actually loved, which is probably not what most people are used to hearing. Right. But I did it for 20 years, and... Um, Eventually got bored with it and felt like I was at a point where I wanted to spend more time with my kids and do something different. And so when I was 40, about a little over a decade ago, I I left Wall Street and shortly after got involved with politics when Hillary Clinton ran for Senate and then ran for president the first time and out of disgust for how she was treated largely by the media but by our country, sort of an awakening for myself and many in 2008 of the sexism in our country. Um, A decade ago, I co-founded a national organization, which I still run, called the New Agenda and the New Agenda Foundation. And one of our main goals is how women are portrayed in the media and the double standards that women face and getting more women in leadership. But my skills in both probably, you know, you wouldn't expect this from Wall Street, but a lot of what you do is track things like Mm -hmm. minutia (laughs) and a lot of minutia and having to remember a lot of minutia to tie things together in in that case 
based on what companies are doing. But that's been, for me, a very transferable skill to use for the list. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it is, it is very forensic in that way. And uh, one of my regular guests, uh, Sarah Kensinger, wrote the um, intro, the foreword to your book. And I, I asked her about this la- uh, last time we talked here. And she was like, oh, yeah, it's a great book. Don't try to read it all at once. You'll get so depressed. <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, about to, I'm two-thirds of the way through now. And I'm like having to set it down and stare off into the middle distance every couple minutes because I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, it's shocking what we've normalized. Even oh. me, I, I, HBO came to my house last week because they're doing a documentary uh-huh. on the truth. And uh, they had me read some of the old weeks as to sort of lay the scene mm-hmm. of what it was like in week 11 when Kellyanne Conway was talking about the alternative mm-hmm. facts and Bowling Green Massacre. And, and there's just things you forget. Even oh, yeah. I forget. Like, I, there's over 10,000 not normal items so far. And mm-hmm. so even if I feel like I have an encyclopedia kind of knowledge of it, it's so important that we realize what we forgot. Like in week 25, which was one of the weeks we were talking about, mm-hmm. Trump said he was going to enact new libel laws to go after our media. Mm-hmm. So it's just like the slow pitter-patter of things that we're losing and forgetting about. Mm-hmm. Oh, definitely, for sure. Um, so I guess let's go back to November 2016. You talk about this in the, a little bit in the beginning of the book, but um, kind of what's, what made you want to start this list and, and how did it kind of get going here? Yeah, well, Sarah was one of the rationales, but I, after the election, I just noticed things were not normal, mm-hmm. that there wasn't a typical Republican versus Democrat policy or agenda that Trump had, and the acts of hate, the Southern Poverty Law Center, who tracks acts of hate in our country, was tracking a record number. It was 400 in those early days on college campuses, on at schools, all over mm-hmm. our communities, and instead of acting, asking people to stop, Trump asked for under understanding. And I read up on authoritarianism and have a little background because I'm Jewish American and was raised with knowledge about the Holocaust. And my alarm just grew as time went on. And the first Saturday of, of the week one was trip down memory lane when Trump was attacking the New York Times, the cast of SNL, and then the cast of Hamilton. <laughs> and I thought to myself, this is not normal. i I visited that day the home of um, Eleanor Roosevelt, who's my North Star, and just the importance of we the people, we the people being our government, of writing things down, which came in part from Sarah about Mm -hmm. the notion that things would change subtly and that if we didn't write down things that were normal to us today, we would forget. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's kind of like the, the thing of the uh, frog in the boiling water. It doesn't notice it's boiling right away. It just, the heat exactly. gets turned up and up. So. Exactly, and I read a really interesting tweet that stuck with me a couple of weeks ago that mm-hmm. said the thing about authoritarianism, it's so mundane. Mm-hmm. Still paying my monthly bill. I'm still going to baseball games, uh-huh. but it's like looking at the world through an Instagram filter. Like, <laughs> everything is not quite right. And that's a really good summary of what it feels like. Oh, like yeah. We're still doing the same things largely, but there's nothing that's normal uh-huh. to what it would be like if this were George Bush type right. or, or, you know, let alone a Bill Clinton type. I mean, oh, this yeah. is just not anything to do with Democrat versus Republican. This sure. is a fight for our democracy. Right. Well, I mean, uh, this was something I was going to ask you about. So, say it had been President Hillary Clinton what would you be doing now? Would you just be working in your foundation and, and doing that? Or, I mean, because I, I imagine the criticism from the other side on you doing this list is, oh, you wouldn't do this list if it was Hillary Clinton, but she's not normal, blah, blah, blah. Like, that's, you know, that's the pushback I see. But what would yeah, you Yeah, and, and believe me, I take no joy in doing mm-hmm. this and would much rather be doing something else. This has fully mm-hmm. cannibalized my entire personal life. I'm spending 30 yeah. to 35 hours a week doing this list. <sighs> and so I, I wouldn't have had to do it with a Hillary Clinton or a George W. Bush when he was president or a Ronald Reagan when he was president, because what I'm capturing in this list is things that are not typical of Republican versus Democrat. Mm-hmm. So when we disagree on tax policy or on health care coverage, those things are not captured in the weekly list. Mm -hmm. It's things that are not normal to our democracy that indicate a degradation of our democracy or norms Mm -hmm. or taking away protections of marginalized communities or the environment or things that are, you know, have been status quo. So, Mm -hmm. for example, and, and this isn't fantastical, Jeff Sessions 
tried to roll back parts of the Civil Rights Act mm-hmm. that relate to LGBT being recognized in the Civil Rights Act uh, in the 1960s. So we're, we're, we're going back half a century, oh, yeah. uh, you know, with some of the things that they're stripping away, and it's just not normal. It's, it's all part of a bigger picture that I see coming together that is largely a white nationalist picture, but of a rising authoritarian regime in, our, in America. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, I wanted to know what, you know, talk about not normal. Now, what what is your criteria about what is not normal? Because, I mean, I agree with pretty much everything you write in the book, but it's not normal. But um, yeah. there was one item uh, I'm looking on week 35 here. It says, uh, Arkansas bill scheduled to go in effect July 30th would make it illegal for a woman to have an abortion without notifying the man who impregnated her, even in cases of rape. Now, I agree with you. That's not normal. That's, you know, definitely mm-hmm. out of the norm. But I can definitely see something like that happening on a state level. Uh, you know, I, I live in Indiana, so you know you can imagine. Yeah. I've, I've got the capacity to imagine something like that happening, yes. even with uh, President Obama, President Hillary Clinton. So, yeah. yeah. What do you think so, about that? So this is all part of, and this happens in authoritarian regimes. Mm-hmm. I mean, what many of us are watching Handmaid's Tale reluctantly. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> watching anymore. Real. I take no joy from that show any longer. <laughs> oh my God. Everyone says season one was easy to watch. It was entertainment. Season two is like, uh, That's what I've heard. here. That's what I've heard. So, I mean, one of the hallmarks of authoritarianism is taking away of rights of marginalized communities mm-hmm. and women. So, you know, a normal debate of abortion rights versus those type of things and what's happened in Indiana mm-hmm. and in Iowa where it's like the heartbeat law and, right. and fights of that are part of, you know, a repeal and a control of others. And so, yes, we, we do get that normally. It's just the extreme of it. I only capture the things that are very extremist. Mm-hmm. And I notice a pattern uh, generally of how they've done things, which is to make marginalized communities and women invisible. Mm. So information disappears. Um, LGBTs are not part of the U.S. census. Uh, information on rights for people of color um, from the HUD website disappears. Um, yeah, references to transgender people uh, disappears from the website early on. Mm-hmm. Uh, in references to women's health, like breast care and, and access to for low-income women for health care coverage disappears from the website. And when you become invisible as a marginalized community, or you know, people with disabilities, same thing, then you don't need protections. And so it's less notice- noticeable that your rights and protections are being taken away from you week after week. And so those are the kind of things that are getting very little media coverage other than at the local level that I try to point out. And uh, I was one of the people screaming my lungs out about what's happening at our southern border. It happened for six weeks before I finally could like be one of the people that helped draw attention with our national media mm-hmm. to bring Bring it to the national attention and stop it. But these are the kind of things that are happening to marginalized communities, and it's a pattern with Trump from the time he started his campaign. And one of the things that I found alarming enough to start to keep the list was that he actually was normalizing this hatred of others mm-hmm. and asking for understanding of it and giving you know a voice to white nationalists and the worst of us that these things were previously like just you know, verboten. Now these people were out in the light of day in the early weeks of the list, like Richard Spencer and white nationalists um, having press conferences in the early weeks of the list that, you know, our media would never have covered something like that before Trump. Mm -hmm. So we went through that period of those voices having a platform and then those voices lost their platform and disintegrated between, you know, within themselves. But that's all part of things that are not normal. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think that's what, you know, as, as, as you pointed out again and again in this book, that's how authoritarianism works is that they find the most marginalized voices and they silence them first, you know, and they move towards the middle, uh, kind of moving from the outside in. And, you know, people think it's not going to be them, but yet you're just not now. Yeah. Yeah. But you're next. So. It is. There's something for everybody. Okay. It's not white, straight, Christian, and male. They'll be coming for you, and or or poor. Yeah, I mean it's literally, uh, and that's what he does with these shiny coins that distract our media. Uh-huh. And 
um, one of many was screaming bloody murder when our media covered his summit with Kim Jong Un mm. the way they covered the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. Like you know, CNN had their clock eight hours till the summit. Da, da, da. It's like ridiculous normalization. His poll numbers went up, and then finally, when that was over, they started covering the southern border, which mm-hmm. had been going on for weeks. Mm-hmm. But our media has had some role in giving him validity and normalcy that has has aided him in basically seeding their the media's own destruction, but they mm-hmm. haven't figured out how to cover him properly. Right, right. Now, um, do you consider yourself a journalist, though, because you deal exclusively with a base of facts, and of course you, in the introduction to the weeks, you give your opinion, and, and you call it a regime, not an administration, and that's, that's maybe editorializing, not that I'm saying you're wrong, but yeah. um, you know what I mean? Those are not the words you'd see in the New York Times or CNN, so, I mean, but I, I you know, you're, you're everything, you got the hundred pages of, uh, you know, footnotes and sources in the back to back up what you're saying, so yeah. I mean, what do you, what, how do you think of yourself in that way? You know, I, I guess I'm, I can add that label. I'm not by background. I don't, uh, mm-hmm. other than um, English 101, I didn't mm-hmm. study journalism in college, and so I just set out to do this as a concerned mm-hmm. citizen, and I've been very strict on the sources I use mm-hmm. in those 100 pages of triple column footnotes. Oh, yeah. It's I stay away from things that are extreme on the right and left, like Daily Coast, or things, you know, that are less, n- not to dis- uh, to disparage them, but mm-hmm. the things that are not as reputable. I try to use sources on left and right, like the Wall Street Journal is one of my main sources, and mm-hmm. arguably they're considered conservative and they're owned by the Murdochs. Mm-hmm. So I, I, it is, you know, the HBO producer says to me, and when he put it this way, it's true. He's like, it's a very just sort of cut and dry set of facts. Mm-hmm. The reason I adopted regime, and it's not widely used by the U.S. media, but I, mm-hmm. I think that's a fault, not a, an advantage. Um, in, in shortly after Trump took office, Reuters, which is much more international in focus, their editor in chief said they would be covering the Trump administration as a regime, mm-hmm. and they set out guidelines for doing that, and I think mm-hmm. they uniquely at many times have been able to cover him and not get sucked into trying to peg him into Republican versus Democrat, which mm-hmm. he is not. There's nothing normal about what's happening in our country, and if you look at it now, I would challenge anybody to tell me what the Republican agenda is or what their policies are or what their platform is for 2018 as we head into the midterms, and the answer is none. It's really become... Uh, one person running our country, both domestically and foreign policy, and realigning the world order. We don't get, you know, we don't get along with our closest allies. Like, how can you fight with Canada? Right. <laughs> and instead, we're gravitating towards uh, Kim Jong Un, and now we're going to have a summit in July with Putin, who, mm. you know, uh, everybody other than Trump and his regime acknowledges tried to interfere in our election and get Trump elected. Mm-hmm. So there are so many things not normal. To me, it's not an administration. An administration is fully staffed. There is a functioning executive branch. There's a functioning White House. This is the biggest turnover we've ever had in a White House. Mm -hmm. Our executive branch is half empty. Um, So there are many signs to me that this is just so far from normal, we're already well along the road to authoritarian regime. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, um, kind of going back to the the lists and and the entries. Is there a word limit you have for each entry? Because I do I do notice they're kind of like tweet length. You know, you try to keep them kind of uh, individualized. Even if you're covering one story, you kind of do it piece That's by piece. That's a good observation. Yeah. You know, I hate to be so pedestrian, but I try to stay consistent throughout the list. Oh and, yeah, no, I like that. And, and, and when I started doing it, and I continue to do this as I'm sitting here talking to you when we hang up. I'll, I'll be like using medium, and I try uh-huh. to make all the items fit into three lines on medium. Mm, okay, nothing more. Yeah, they're not tweet length. It's just because of. Okay, I, I try to slice them down and it requires time to do it yeah. but yeah because I figure it's just going to be too long otherwise well no it's important too because I mean this is how you take time to consider what's happening because if, if it's a big block of text you can't really like see it all happening you really have to break apart some of these and like just look at them and stare at them for a minute like I had to read some of them three or four times I'm like I'm sorry did I read that right <laughs> <laughs> did that really happen yeah. yes believe exactly. me I'm writing week you know, this week about what's happening at detention centers and I'm uh-huh. feeling the same like these really uh yeah 
Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I was reading through the book, and, you know, it, it's, this, it's this 12 months or year of, of Trump, and I was getting through, and I was, like, through to halfway, you know, six months in, and I'm like, oh, I'm making good time. I should be done with the book soon. And then I looked, and then the lists are getting longer and longer and longer. So, I mean, is that because you think things are spinning further out of control, or are we just noticing things more, or what, what do you think? So, I've been trying to, trying to be consistent, mm-hmm. so I don't have human error. As much as I can, like, control human error, which means, like, Please, I say to people, please don't take it personally. I don't follow you back on Twitter. I'm mm-hmm. just trying to do everything consistently. Like I followed around two to three hundred people when I started. I want to follow the same news sources or rele- relevant experts to what's happening mm-hmm. in, in a period of time. And so I, I believe I'm being pretty consistent in what I'm covering week after week. But what's changed is uh, as Trump has staffed up his regime, there's more hands deconstructing our democracy. Democracy. So there might be weeks where Pruitt is um, in a number of items, or Nunes is doing things that draw items, or um, Nick Mulvaney, who took over Elizabeth Warren's Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, all the steps he's taken to dismantle that. There's just more people at work deconstructing our democracy. Mm-hmm. And Trump, as well, as he's gotten away with more, has done more. Um, and I, the Washington Post, I'm going to include that in this week's list, has noticed that his Twitter activity is picking up. Mm. And just an observation, you know, for good or bad, and believe me, this is my least favorite part of keeping the list, I have to tweet the, capture the tweets he, he sends that are not normal, Oof. where he says the press is the enemy of our country, where he calls um, migrant children, uh, that they infest our country. Like, these are things that are not normal that I have to capture for the list. Mm-hmm. But I notice, like, week after week as I'm doing them, I don't use the link of the actual tweet. I try to have it captured by media in case the tweet's taken down. Mm -hmm. There's fewer and fewer media sources that are keeping up with his tweets, which is – so I'm trying to be consistent because these are all not normal. We're hopefully never going to have another U.S. leader that that tweets the things he does. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So this is – you know, I'm trying to capture them all. So we can see patterns, so we can trace our way back to normalcy. Sure. Well, and the tweets are particularly hard to deal with because it's like you said, it's it's kind of like the shiny object thing where it's like he'll tweet something crazy and we all focus on that, and meanwhile they're robbing our pockets blind, you know, on the other hand. Yeah. But it's like you can't. But this is still the president, and he's still saying something. So you can't. Are you really going to ignore that? You know what I mean? But it's like it's kind of this dichotomy. It's like, what do we do? Do we focus on this? Do yeah. we not? Like I can't look in two places at once. So and that's what I. That's why I'm. It takes me thirty to thirty-five hours. Of week. And that's also why, you know, I started to do the podcast, which comes out Monday mm-hmm. morning, because oh, cool. I realize people work, sometimes people work two or three jobs. They don't have time to listen into or read, like, what is now a list of 160, 170 items. Mm-hmm. And so I, I try to give a synopsis and some tips of the way, because another observation is our media tends to cover... 20% of the stories, 80% of their coverage, mm-hmm. and there'll be weeks, important items, like when the Nielsen's Department of Homeland Security started to keep a list of journalists. Mm. That happened on a Friday. It got almost no attention because our media that week was focused on Scott Pruitt mm-hmm. and all his you know, misdeeds, which are significant. Right. So that happens more and more, and so the importance of like having going through this pretty painful exercise for me of having everything so you can focus on the news and I'm like still looking for the mundane crap that you probably missed this week like Mm -hmm. Trump yesterday revoked another Obama era protection of oceans and our Great Lakes. It's like, hello, it's Tuesday, but that will be on the list because we'll need to have a trail to trace our way back to Mm -hmm. undo his damage. Right, yeah, definitely. I mean, I don't know how all this is going to turn out but reading your book, I was reminded when I was a kid, um, my family had a a history book, like a uh, high school history book that was published in 1941. And it was just kind of like the last chapter of the book was just like, well, things seem bad now. I hope it turns out well. See you guys. <laughs> like, and this is kind of feels the same way. I'm like, I don't know how this is going to turn out. But, you know, if my, my kids are young now and if they, 
you know, get to grow up in a, you know, non-authoritarian country. I'm, I'm hoping they get to read this and just be like, what the, what was going on? Like, this is crazy. I know. <laughs> and I, I did an event a few weeks ago with Heather Richardson, who's a history professor at BC, and something she said really stuck with me, and that's that we are on a razor's edge. Mm-hmm. We literally could lose our democracy. So it's so important that everybody gets out the vote on November 2018 mm-hmm. to put some check and balance into this craziness that's mm-hmm. happening. He's gotten away with everything he's done, with the exception of this week. Mm-hmm. And it's not even clear to me that he's not going to try to just continue to do it through a different route. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's right now it's just very chaotic in terms of their response to what what happens now in the southern border. Right. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, now, this is uh, this book is covering the first year of Trump, and you said you're obviously continuing the list week by week, so I assume there's a sequel in the works for year two? You know, I'm not sure. I'm actually speaking to my agent about what to do with the rest of the list because they're not as conducive. You know, the first year was four thousand items. Mm. We passed four thousand before we got in the first half of Oh man. <laughs> Because it's escalating. So I think I'm going to be a little more creative. They'll, they will be made public somehow, but I'm kind of in the thought process. I haven't come up with the idea yet. But I'd like to do something different that other than just the list themselves, something mm-hmm. that accompanies it. And I'm still thinking about that um, as a way to present them because it's it's much longer. And I, I, and I feel like they need more context as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right, for sure. Now, in the list of not normal things, you know, in there is also the, some of the not normal things are people standing up to the not normal, other not normal things, and, and does what gives you hope? I mean, that kind of makes me hopeful, and, you know, when we see these things happen, and people like this this past week with the um, child policy that, that people stood up against, you know, that's not yeah. normal, too, but it's also not normal in a good way. So. Yeah, so this, to me, has been the greatest comfort that if you look at, for example, what happened with Hitler, it was gradual, and um, last fall, I, my daughter happened to be studying abroad, so I, when we were in the Netherlands, I visited their resistance museum, and in the early years, very few people stood up. It was really just like the far left, the mm. college students. People just, you know, they didn't notice the slow slide, and it wasn't until years later when they started, like, drafting out, not drafting, pulling their white men out to war for Germany that they started to truly resist. Mm -hmm. To our credit in our country, like, day one, starting with the Women's March when Mm -hmm. 4 million people showed up, we've been fighting back, and it would be that much worse, including what happened this week, and escalating that much more quickly if it weren't for citizens and the checks and balances that we're trying to put in place ahead of the election. So I do take great comfort in how engaged people are. Mm -hmm. I recognize that 35% of our country hates the fact that we have gay marriage, hates the fact that we have people of color in the workplace and that have Mm -hmm. equal rights and that women can work and have some equality and just don't want that. Mm -hmm. And to them, Trump holding meetings on immigration where there's 40 men in a room and Mm -hmm. one woman is the way they want America to be. Right. And they're just not going to, like, move forward with the rest of us. So mm-hmm. we're never going to get everyone. But I think there's enough people who are either engaged because they're Democrats or people who were never involved in the political process mm-hmm. that want to fight for our values and democracy. Um, that gives me great comfort that we're not the Naomi Shulman poem of people, mm. you know, just being the nice people as they, you know, Germans march, the Jews right. down the streets. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I've noticed in poll after poll, whenever they ask people, like, there's about 35% of people that always have the worst opinion about everything. So I think you're right. Yeah. I think there is just a core of about a third of America that's just unreachable, apparently. So. Yeah, that they just don't like any of this progress, and they hated the fact that we had a black American oh, president, yeah. and Couldn't God forbid we would have a woman after that. Oh. That would have been like the end of time. Exactly. And don't forget, we, you know, there was quick progress on gay marriage. Mm-hmm. They hate that gay people mm-hmm. can marry. Yep. I mean, there's been a lot of progress in our country, and they, a lot of people in our country don't want that. Yep, that's absolutely true. Now, uh, so you uh, are working very hard on this, and, and you think about things so the rest of us don't have to, or you at least distill it down for us. Um, how do you relax? What do you do to, to kick back and not think about this stuff? <laughs> God, I'm just trying to hold my shit together. I mean, honestly, I realize the importance of it, mm-hmm. and I get a lot of 
gratitude back from people on social media. Um, and believe me, there's times like my kids will say to me, just stop, like last year, just stop, let someone else do it. <laughs> now we realize, like, excuse my French, but I'm the only asshole that kept doing it. Like a lot of people started and finished, like, you know, before – 2017 uh-huh. even started, so I recognize the historical import of this exercise. Mm. So I'm yeah, going to continue to persist and just try to keep my sanity together. And yeah, I get to the gym every day. I have some mm-hmm. time to like release all the stress and all the horribleness. But it's believe me, no pleasure. But I'm I'm committed for our country to continue doing it. Oh sure, absolutely. Well, I mean, I was just watching Rachel Maddow break down the other day. It's like, yeah, how can you not feel something when you see this? Like, it's like I know you're yeah. supposed to like just deliver the news like straight face, but it's like after a while, it's got to wear on you just to like say, uh, now we're taking babies into camps. Oh my, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, how are you not feeling weeks, something? <laughs> this week was like the third week I wrote on my Twitter and Facebook where I was like. I had tears rolling down my face oh, when I was yeah. picturing out the week for the picture for week eighty two, which is um a Getty we have a license with Getty because people help us raise money, thank you, mm-hmm. to to do that. And um other than Charlottesville and the picture of Maisha Johnson over her husband's casket mm-hmm. standing with her daughter in the mask matching dresses. Those two pictures are in the book. Mm-hmm. But this is the third week where I just I, I, I was work with our editor and I was just saying to her, Man, like Look at all these photos of kids with like mm-hmm. guns. It's if you go to the weekly dot org you can see the one we ended up picking, but there were many contenders of what was happening to these little toddlers, these mm-hmm. little babies being separated from their parents in a strange land Ugh. with men with guns. It was right. just so disgusting and mm-hmm. heartbreaking. Absolutely. Well, is there anything else I didn't ask you about uh, you'd like to get in there before we go here? You know, I just think it's super important that we all hold our media accountable as well. And it's a, you know, a double-edged sword because I want to be supportive of our, our media and I personally like get subscriptions to help support them financially, but they really, I think, messed up with um, how they covered him in the summit, mm-hmm. and conversely, we're not covering in the southern border. And I think the only reason they did start covering that is those of us who do have big Twitter followings and then others who could, like, amplify that tweeted at them. Like, you have to get down there. You have to cover this, mm-hmm. which has been going on for six weeks. So it's so important for us as citizens to be tweeting at our, our media to talk about stories that need coverage, which to me, the uncovered stories in my weekly list are the marginalized community. Mm -hmm. what's happening to people with disabilities, to the transgender individuals and and gay people and black Americans and what's happening at our border and Muslims and Jews. These stories are not, they're just largely local coverage. Mm -hmm. Um, The Washington Post has done a pretty good job and now AP is doing an excellent job on what's happening in our border. But the New York Times hasn't broken a single story on our southern border. Mm -hmm. And it's just like unacceptable to me. Finally this week, MS NBC is down there with cameras. We need that kind of coverage when these things come up. We mm-hmm. need national coverage, and we need to have them stop normalizing him. <clears throat> and I think if we all tweet and are on them as citizens, that will change. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, I remember when the Trump first announced his candidacy, and it wasn't the Huffington Post covering it in their entertainment section or something. And I feel like some yes. people have never really stopped doing it, having that mindset about it. You know what I mean? Yeah, so. then that was the way to do it. And yeah. look how we normalized him. Mm-hmm. And now, like, Joe yep. Scarborough, who's one of the worst at giving him airtime, has turned on him. But... Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it's because of you folks that we have him. Right. And learn yeah. your lessons and do it better. Do what Reuters did. Mm-hmm. Cover this as a, an authoritarian regime, which yep. is what it essentially is in many ways. Mm-hmm. So right. that's my parting words, of, you know, the importance that we all stay engaged and involved. And if you need to take a week off, Take a week off this summer. You can come back and read the list and listen to the podcast and be caught up. <laughs> it'll, still, it'll still be there. But, um, oh, it'll still be there. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, last question before we go. I always ask this. What music have you been listening to lately? Oh, boy. I'm like 
the least hip person. So <laughs> I'm, I'm like afraid if you looked at my iPod while I listened to it at the gym. No judgment. I, I mean, my kids are always embarrassed. Like, get that 80s station off. Hey, uh, no shame. <laughs> no shame in that. I am definitely not hip. I'm like, I listen to ACDC okay. and ABBA. I mean, I'm, it's eclectic. But, um, yeah, and Amy Mann. And, uh, yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, old okay. stuff. All right, gotcha. No, no problem. <laughs> well, well, hey, thanks for taking the time to talk with me, and congratulations to your son on graduating. That's excellent. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah, uh, have a good day, and take care of yourself. All right, thanks for having me. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. If you enjoy this podcast, there are several ways to support it. Join the Rob Burgess Show mailing list. Go to tinyletter.com forward slash the Rob Burgess Show and type in your email address. Then respond to the automatic message. I have a Patreon account, which can be found at patreon.com forward slash Rob Burgess Show Patreon. I hope you'll consider supporting in any amount. Also, please make sure to comment, follow, like, subscribe, share, rate, and review everywhere the podcast is available, including iTunes, YouTube, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Facebook, Twitter, Internet Archive, TuneIn, and RSS. The official website for the podcast is www.therobburgessshow.com. You can find out more about me by visiting my website, www.thisburgess.com. And if you have something to say, record a voice memo on your smartphone and send it to the Rob Burgess Show at gmail.com. Include voice memo in the subject line of the email. Until next time.